The Minor Prophet Book of Micah. Let's pray. Father, I pray that I would be granted the grace to handle this book in a way that is glorifying to you and to your Son and to the Spirit of God. Give me the words, the thoughts. I pray that Micah might at this time the truths found in it might be a book that you would use to help the people in this room, the people that hear my voice. I ask this in Christ's name. Amen. So, I want to introduce you to Micah. Micah is seven chapters. We're not going to we're not going to be able to cover the entire book. This is going to be another two-parter, Lord willing, uh, three weeks from today. If God wills, that's where I hope to be. I want to introduce you to Micah. Micah of Morasheth. Micah chapter 1, verse 1. The word of the Lord that came to Micah of Morasheth in the days... We see when he lives. Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah. Basically, he was a contemporary with Isaiah. And in fact, if you compare some things from Isaiah to Micah, they're identical. They're, there's actually extended portions that are identical. And God gave the same word to both prophets at that day, at that time, and them being contemporary. Now, <clears throat> verse 2. Listen to this. This just sets the tone as it so often does in the Minor Prophets. Hear you peoples, all of you. Everyone. All of them. Pay attention. O oh, earth. The whole earth. God is calling to attention here. And all that is in it. And let the Lord God be a witness against you. So you see, God is witnessing the Lord from His holy temple. For behold, the Lord is coming out of His place and will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth. That's a destructive tread. The mountains will melt under Him. And the valleys will split open like wax before the fire, like waters poured down a steep place. And this is for the transgression of Jacob and for the sins of the house of Israel. Now look, we do well to pay attention. You see what's happening. Pay attention, O earth. Look, look at what God is pronouncing against these people. Who, who are they? I mean, when you think of Israel, you think of God's people. You think of the people that aren't Gentiles. You think of the people that God had special, a special relationship with. And he's calling the whole earth to come to attention to this. And I'll tell you this, if God sets aside any kind of people for any sort of purpose, and we, know, we recognize this is Old Testament Israel, but what, what's he, what he's saying is this, the Lord, Lord is going to swoop down from heaven against Israel. And it's a witness against us all. Because I'll tell you this, you know what? Any time that God executes judgment against a sinner, we all do well to sit up and take notice. And you know that's what it's for. You, you see it right there. Why is it happening? Why? Five, verse 5, you see it. This is for the transgression of. And you know what? You could, it says Jacob. This is for the sins of the house of Israel. But you could put anything in the book. This is for the transgression of Manchester. This is for the sins of the house of... And you can put your name in there. 
The fact is that it's because of sin and it's because of transgression and God is going to come down out of heaven and he is going to melt the mountains and he's going to split the valleys. That's what we have here and it's a witness against us all. Now here's the thing. I, I read through Micah repeatedly and I just want you to see something. Pay, pay careful attention to the sins of these people. Now I know if, if you go carefully th through this entire book, you will see that idolatry is in there. But I'll tell you, their sins have a very distinct flavor. And I would just take you to Micah chapter 2, verse 2. And just look at the first two words. Micah 2, 2. They covet. And I know it goes on to say they covet fields, and they actually go after, they seize them. The idea there is unjustly. They covet houses. They take them away. They oppress a man in his house, a man in his inheritance. You know, they go after, they go after what belongs to other people. They covet. What does it mean to covet? It means you want something that belongs to somebody else. You remember, you just want to think about covetousness for a second. Because covetousness and greed and materialism is the primary thing that God puts his finger on in Micah. And I just want you to remember something. The Apostle Paul, you remember what happens? He says, I was alive once. He was pretty vigorous, religiously. And he says, then the law came. He said, now look, the law isn't sinful. The law is holy. But, and he says, I wouldn't have known unless the law said, do not covet. He said, I wouldn't have known that unless the law said that. But you know what he said? He said that basically what he tried to do, he, he tried not to sin. But he said that sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. He said, you know the, you know the thing about the law, the commandment of uh, the Tenth Commandment? You see, you can say, well, I don't have any other God, so I don't have any God before him. You can say that. You can basically deny the different forms of idolatry. And you can say, God is my God, which the Jews did. You can say, I don't have idols like, like the Philistines do, or like you know, Moloch over here. I don't, I, I don't worship that. I don't have Dagon set up on my uh, fireplace. You see, you know, you could get away with the second commandment. Well, I was trained from a child. I, I don't use the Lord's name in vain. I don't dishonor the Sabbath. I, you can go right through these things. I've, I've honored my mother and father. You see, all of those commandments, you can, you can figure out an external manifestation. But you can't do that with covetousness. And Paul realized, he said, you know, you know what really got me? He said, you know what killed me? You know, you know what undid me? You know what exposed me for who I really was? It was that 10th commandment. It got me. It laid me bare. He said, Why? There's no external element. It's all a heart matter. And he says that sin actually seized an opportunity through the commandment. The commandment said, don't covet. And it's like the more he tried to covet, sin along with his flesh, and he was just undone. It just, it, it, it did him in. What did God say? God said, don't covet. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, his male servant, his female servant, his ox, his donkey, or anything that's your neighbor's. You see the sin. You know what it's like? It's like the child. You get a child come in here today with a toy and another child looks at it and they want it. They want that. They're dissatisfied with what they have. Dissatisfied that they don't have what somebody else has. It's basically materialism. It's, it's greed. But you know, you visit somebody's house and you say, I like this house. I want this house. And you want it. And, and people could say, well, hey, that's, that's just natural. Everybody does that. I mean, the, the, one of the reasons I want to touch on this is because, look, there's nothing new under the sun. How modern is all this? I mean, all you have to do is look at the advertising. You ever think what advertising is? It's meant to make you covet. That's what it's steered at. Make you want what you don't have. And listen, 
Listen to this. Paul, the apostle, says to the Ephesians, you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Listen, hear this well. God damns covetous people. You see, sexually immoral, yeah, the guy that's fornicating all the time, the homosexuals, you tend to put them in the... It was like I was saying the other night on Tuesday. You know, we don't typically put greedy people out of the church, but they certainly did 2,000 years ago. It's, this, this is the reason why the wrath of God is coming. Covetousness, which is a form of idolatry, Paul says. This is what we're faced with here. This speaks to us. Notice, notice Micah 3.11. It's heads, the heads of state. It's leaders. They give judgment for a bribe. Judges. It's priests teach for a price. It's prophets practice divination for money. You see, they're greedy. This is what this is, what is controlling in this life. Yet they lean, notice this, they lean on the Lord and they say, is not the Lord in the midst of us? No disaster shall come upon us. You know, when I think about this, think about covetous people who are basically, they're religious enough or they're just carnally secure enough. It's, it's going to be okay. Ruby and I were down on the streets on Friday and people are so smug. They are so safe. They just go on in their sins and they feel like Nothing's going to, peace, peace. Nothing's going to happen. Look at this. Verse 12. Therefore, because of you, Zion shall be plowed as a field. Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruins and the mountain of the house a wooded height. That's basically, the Temple Mount. What it's saying is the Temple Mount will become a hill overgrown with brush. That's basically what that's saying. And folks, this speaks to our generation. Don't be deceived. We don't want to be deceived. Covetousness is a horrible sin. It's the one that smote Paul. It's the one that... I mean, don't be deceived. The judgment of God is coming because of these things. I'll tell you this. Jesus himself, you remember the time when the young man came to him and said... Lord, tell my brother to give me part of the inheritance. And Jesus said this, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Be careful, folks. Be careful. We as Christians need to be in the habit of giving, not taking, not amassing, not being materialistic. And then here's the thing. Before all this judgment is coming, he says, basically, I'm going to wipe out Zion, he uses three words, the mountain of the Lord, the mountain where the temple is. He calls it Zion, he calls it Jerusalem. He basically says, I'm going to wipe this out. Okay, so that's the book. You know, that's kind of what you expect in an Old Testament minor prophet. And then we get this shift Look at this in verse 4, or chapter 4, rather. Chapter 4, verse 1. A radical shift. So you see in 12, Zion will be plowed. Jerusalem, a heap. The mountain of the house, it's basically going to become overgrown. But then, it shall come to pass in the later days or the last days, that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains. This is, this is what's quoted verbatim in Isaiah chapter 2. And it shall be lifted up above the hills, and people shall flow to it. 
And many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. That's a picture. He shall judge between many peoples, shall decide for strong nations far away. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore, but they shall sit every man under his vine, under his fig tree. No one shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord host has spoken for all the peoples. Walk each in the name of its God, but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. So, what just happened? What just happened between chapter 3, where the whole thing is going to be destroyed and ruined, and God is going to come down, and He's going to come down in anger. He's going to descend, swoop in out of heaven upon the mountains and the high places and the valleys, and He's going to just wreak havoc. And then, suddenly, in chapter 4, it's bang! We're transported to another scene altogether. What just happened there? Now the mountain that was going to be ruined, that was going to be overgrown, is suddenly glorious. And look, I'm sure it's apparent to everybody that can read this. Something really good all of a sudden happens here. Something very positive. Something that's definitely full of good news. Something really glorious. Just, just I mean, there was a massive shift. And so my main task right now is this. I want to dissect this. I want to define this. I want to diagnose this. What is God describing here? And so, let me ask you this. Just the term latter days or last days. When does the Bible say that the last days are? When are the latter days? The gospel age. What would lead us to believe that? Maybe texts like this. In the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Who said that? Who said that in the last days God will pour out his spirit on all flesh? Another minor prophet. Who quotes that in the New Testament? Peter. And what does Peter tell us? That got fulfilled when? day of Pentecost, when the Spirit was given. And so, when were the latter days? When are the last days? Well, certainly, that time period when the Spirit of God was given to the church, listen to this. Jesus has appeared, this comes out of Hebrews 9, almost to where we read. Jesus has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Okay, so when, does it, when do the end of the ages come? Well, when Christ gave himself as a sacrifice. So, Christ giving himself as a sacrifice and the Spirit of God given was pretty close together, folks. It was basically all right in that same time period of the book of Acts, the ends of the Gospels. Those are the last days. Have you read this before? As you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore we know that it is the last hour. How do we know it's the last hour? How do we know we're in the last days? Well, we could quote Peter. We could quote the Apostle Paul, because they talked about the last days. They talked about what it would be like in the last days. John says this, there's many antichrists in the world. There's a lot of people against Christ. Don't think antichrist and they got horns on their head. An antichrist is against Christ. And if you're not for him, you're against him. Antichrist. And why are there so many antichrists? And what does it tell us about the signs of the times? Well, it tells us we're in the last hour. Not just in the last days. Even back then, it was the last hour. And that means you're getting pretty close to the end, folks. Pretty close to the end. So when we have this prophet Micah say in the latter days or in the last days, 
Oh, that may very well have to do with the gospel age. That may have to do with the age we live in that was set in motion in the last days when Christ was offered a sacrifice and the Spirit of God came upon the church, which is basically the state we're in right now, post-sacrifice, post-Pentecost. But then there's this. Notice Micah 4.1. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established, notice this, as the highest of the mountains, and it shall be lifted up above the hills, and peoples shall flow to it. Higher than Everest, higher than Kilimanjaro, higher than your Matterhorn, higher than K2. Now listen, when it says higher, it doesn't mean physically higher. But this is greater. It's just, like, it's just like the author of Hebrews was saying that everything that has to do with Christ and everything that has to do with His covenant and His sacrifice and His blood, it's all bigger. It's all greater. And what you've got here is a mountain that's higher than every other mountain. I'll tell you this. The physical Mount Zion is not higher than Everest. But this mountain is higher than all of them. Listen to this. Listen. Daniel. You remember Daniel interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's dream. This is what he said. You saw, O king, a great image, mighty, exceeding bright, frightening. It had a head of gold, a chest of silver, thighs of bronze, legs of iron, feet of iron and clay. As you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand. Remember that tabernacle that wasn't made with human hands? We're getting into the realm here of that which is not made by human hands. A stone was cut out, and it struck the image, broken in pieces, became like chaff, and the wind carried it all away so that not a trace could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. And you know what Daniel says? There is a guy, Nebuchadnezzar. I want to tell you something. After he got done interpreting that, he said this to him. There is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. There it is again. Latter days. The last days. What happens in the last days? There's a mountain. And it fills the whole earth. What mountain fills the whole earth? You see, you have to recognize what this is. It's a mountain that's higher. It's highest of all the mountain. And it's a mountain that fills the whole earth. And it's a mountain that has to do with this one who smashed against all the kingdoms of this world. Starting with the head, which was Nebuchadnezzar, and working down through all these great kingdoms of man. And it just comes and smashes it all and sets up a kingdom that is above all these kingdoms. And this happens in the latter days, folks. And I would just say this. It makes you wonder. Many nations are going to flow into this. It makes you wonder. So if I come over to the New Testament, which was written in the last days, is there anything in this written in the last days New Testament that talks about a mountain that is... Zion, that is Jerusalem, and that people flock to. Anywhere in the New Testament? One place I can think of, and it is found in Hebrews chapter 12. And we should look there. Open in your Bibles to Hebrews 12. There is... You, you remember how Hebrews starts... That basically we're told God in times past God has spoken he basically spoke to our forefathers through the prophets but in these last days what, what's he done? spoken to us by way of his son these last days you see the author of Hebrew he's already acknowledging in these last we're, we're in the last days okay so you have a book that we know is last days. Does he talk about a mountain? That's Zion, that's Jerusalem, and that people go to. Oh, he certainly does. 
read with me here. Because this, this, I want us to figure out what in the world Mike is talking about. And I think there's no better place for us to get our bearings than right here. Hebrews 12, 18. And he's speaking to Christians. So, so for you have not come. So the first thing he's going to do is he's going to tell Christians where they haven't come. He's going to tell them where they have come. Because remember, Micah tells us about a mountain that all the people are coming to. Well, he's going to tell us about the mountain that Christians come to, that all the nations come to. But the first mountain he's going to tell us about is the one that Christians don't come to. You have not come to what may be touched. Ah, he's talking about... See, when we talk about a mountain that fills the whole earth, we're not talking about a literal mountain. When we talk about a mountain that's higher than every other mountain, we're not talking about one that's physically higher than Mount Everest. That's not the point here, folks. We're talking about something else. You have not come to what may be touched. You see, the mountain that we come to, we can't touch it. But what's he com why is he even saying that? Because there is a mountain that can be touched. There is a mountain that is physical. And it's a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given if even a beast touches the mountain. Now, look, they weren't supposed to touch it. But the point is it could be touched. Oh, you died if you touched it. But make no mistake what he's saying here. That mountain could be touched. If you touched it, you died. God certainly was not giving permission to Israel to touch it. But it was physical. That's the point. And if you touched it, even a beast touched the mountain, it would be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come, not to that mountain, you've come, this literally says, Zion Mountain. That's where you've gone, to the Zion mountain, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels and festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Now, think with me. Micah says, the highest of all mountains, and he calls it Zion. He calls it Jerusalem. That's what, this, that's what we're faced with. Daniel says it fills the whole earth. The author of Hebrews calls it Mount Zion, heavenly Jerusalem. Micah says that people will flow into it. You know what Hebrews says? That if you're a Christian, this is where you've gone. You know what all the people from the nations who will ever become a Christian, all the people of Israel who will ever be true Israel, they've got to flow to this mountain. This is the, this is the Christian mountain. This is what we have here. Now look, notice verse 18. You want to see this. You've not come to what may be touched. That's not where the Christian's gone. You haven't come to this mountain. But, there, but this mountain is real. This mountain exists. There's another mountain. The one, it's the one you haven't come to if you're a Christian. It's physical. It's within the touch. It's within the feel boundaries. When the writer describes the mountain as what may be touched, oh, yeah. folks, you see what he means. You want to take care that you don't, oh, nobody here wants to slight this mountain. 
When he says that Christians haven't come to the mountain that can be touched, most people have. We sang a song. It talked about Mount Sinai. It's no hiding place, folks. And that's where most people are. And they don't have any hiding place. You want to you want to pay very careful attention. The exact name of this mountain, it's not given. You know what's not given? It doesn't have to be. Everybody knows what it is. We all know it. It's that mountain that could be touched, but if you touched it, you died. It's that mountain that was wrapped in smoke. It was wrapped in thunder. That's what, that's what the author of Hebrews is telling us. This thing had thunder and it had lightning and it had smoke and it had fire. And the whole mountain trembled. Listen to Exodus 24. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord. You want to get that. What was on Sinai? God came down on that mountain. The glory of God came down. God was on that mountain. The mountain of Sinai. And listen to it. The appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Deuteronomy 4 says, The mountain burned with fire to the heart of heaven. It was wrapped in darkness. You just ask this. What is it in the Bible that has fire and darkness at the same time? You want to be very careful you don't misinterpret this mountain. Folks, this is hell on earth. You want to know a place where there's fire and dark? And don't think, people that say God's not in hell, oh, you better believe that's what makes hell. That's, that's what makes hell, hell. This is altogether fearful. Never forget what took place on that mountain. Wrapped in darkness, cloud, and gloom. Deuteronomy 5.22, the Lord spoke. Moses is telling them, reminding them, the Lord spoke to all your assembly at that mountain, out of the midst of the fire, the cloud, the thick darkness, with a loud voice. What did He do? He gave commandments. And He wrote them on two tablets of stone. Look. I want you to recognize something. Everybody, you need to recognize this about the two mountains. Do you know what the author of Hebrews says? He says, when you go to Mount Zion, God, the judge of all, is there. Christ, the sprinkled blood. You see, when you go to Mount Zion, God is there. Who's at Mount Sinai? God came down. God is there. God is at both mountains. God's at both mountains. When you come, you see, this is all about coming. You haven't come to that mountain, but you have come to that mountain. That's what Micah's talking about. The nations, they say, let us come to this mountain of the house of the Lord. Come, where have you gone? You see what this has to do with? This has to do with two mountains and they both represent the presence of God. God is present on both those mountains and we approach those. You see, this all has to do with how we approach God. And there are two ways to approach God. That's what you have here. Two ways. These two ways are represented by two mountains. Mount Sinai, Mount Zion. But you say, wait a second, isn't there only one way to God? What did Jesus say about the way to God? Well, He said, I am the way, the life, and the truth. And nobody goes to the Father except through Me. Didn't He say that? If Jesus says He's the way, and no one comes unto the Father except through Him, then he, isn't He the only way? Hear me. I'm not saying there are two ways to God for sinners. I'm saying there are two ways to God for men. Jesus took one. And I highly commend everybody else in this room take the other. You see, 
There was a day Jesus had a run-in with a rich young man. He was a ruler. And you remember what he said. Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? What was our Lord's answer? Did he say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father except through me. You know what Jesus' answer to that young man was? You know it. He said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he, the Lord Jesus Christ, said to him, you've answered correctly. Listen to what he says. You answered correctly. Do this and live. That's what he said. Do this and you will live. Did Jesus start by taking this man to Mount Zion? He did not. And to his own sprinkled blood because that's what you find at Mount Zion. He did not go that path. You know where he first took him? He took him to the fire. To the gloom. He took him to the fiery mountain of Sinai. He takes him to the law. Isn't that amazing? Jesus takes him to the very mountain Christians do not come to. You say, what is he trying to do? Is he trying to, is he trying to get this guy to become a Christian? Or is he not trying to get this guy to become a Christian? He actually takes him to the wrong mountain. This man was looking for a way to God. He wanted eternal life. Jesus has not come to the very fiery furnace and the belching smoke and the gloomy darkness of Sinai. When he said all these things I kept from my youth up. Do you, know, do you realize what he was saying? All these things I've kept from the, my youth up. You know, he, he was saying this. I am ready to stand before the holiness of God. I'm ready to do that. And the legal demands of the law of God. And, and I'm ready to say to him, yes, I've done that. Legal demands. That's, that's where this is. Look, if there's nothing else frightening about the Mount Sinai, this is frightening. If you touched it, you died. If an animal touched it, you died. Now you could touch it. It was physical. So it was within the realm that you could actually walk over there and touch it. God said, you touch it, you die. One of your animals touches it, you die. You know, if we had something up here, if that speaker right there was like a live wire and we knew that if one of our children touched it, they would die. You tend to avoid things that you know if you touch it, you die. It's like you tell your children, don't touch that thing over there, you'll die. Don't, don't climb up that power pole out here and touch that transformer up there. You die if you do that. Go, don't, don't go stand in the motorway. Motorways are places that if you stand, you die. We tend to avoid places like this. This is exactly what was true of Mount Sinai. It just, everything about it. Think about the picture of it. You think, well, God came down on Mount Sinai. Well, why wasn't there like birds singing? And do you remember what it was like? It was like lightning and thunder and darkness. And the, the, I mean, the lightning was spraying out of there. And there was a trumpet. And it kept getting louder and louder and louder and louder. It got louder until, I mean, this trumpet is going off. And the people, even the bravest among them, they're quivering inside. They said, Moses, we can't tolerate this anymore. Don't let God speak to us. We're going to die. And, and it says right there in, in Hebrews 12 that even Moses was trembling. Even Moses was saying, uh, you know, God said to him, they're right in saying that. They, can, they better not approach me. And so Moses did. But he's trembling inside. This thing, this thing is, uh, folks, this mountain is lost in fire. It's lost in darkness. This is just like hell on earth. And God means that mountain to look that way. Hell. Hell, there's gloom, there's dread, uh, there's a, a tempest in this thing. The whole thing is about God coming down. Do you recognize what all this is about? This is just a, it's a terrible manifestation of the holiness of God and the rigidness of the law. And God from that mountain, he declares these Ten Commandments. And he tells those people, you do this and you live. And that's what Jesus told that young man. Do this and you will live. This is, this, 
what, what is happening on this mountain is this, I mean, it's the terrible, blinding, dark, and it's, it's just dread, it's tempest, it's, it's everything that causes men to fear. It's a place that if you go to, you die. This God's divine presence, it's, it's like, can, can you imagine? Can you imagine if you just crawled over and like touched the threshold of that mountain? You know what hell's like? Hell's like you just get thrown right into the middle of this mountain. That's what this is all about. This is, this, when man comes to God at the mountain of the law, it is utterly, it is absolutely a terrifying thing. It's, this is what it is to come face to face with God without a Savior, folks. That's what Mount Sinai is. That's why it is so hellish. And that's why it is so frightening. And it's meant to be that. It's meant to speak. You do not want to go to God. You don't want to come to Him trying to keep His commandments. Everything about that way just screams, don't come this way. Don't come here. Everything about this imagery is meant to show you that you better not, you dare not approach God on this basis. Everything about this picture says you better stand back. You better move back. If you come here, you will die. Can you see it? Darkness and gloom. You know, it almost takes, it's like you almost forget about what a, what a kind of Texas thunderstorm is. Until you're standing out there in the open and you just feel vulnerable and exposed. We've got gloom and fire and smoke and fierce lightning. It splits through the darkness. There's terrifying cracks of thunder. They rip across the scenery and the sound rolls down the sides of that mountain and that trumpet just gets louder and louder and louder and louder and it's unnerving even the brave among them and then God speaks. And it's like over the top. It's just too much. The voice of God. Folks, let me tell you something. This is a wonderful way to approach God. For any of you who have carefully and perfectly done everything God's commanded. This is the way for you if you've never turned to the right. Because this is what God said. He gave the commandments. He said, you don't murder. You don't commit adultery. You don't steal. You don't bear false witness. No covenant. These words the Lord spoke at the mountain out of the midst of the fire, the cloud, thick darkness, loud voice. God told Moses, you tell him this, you shall not turn aside. I mean, not even once. You don't turn aside to the right hand or to the left. You shall walk in all the way that the Lord your God has commanded you that you may live. Oh, a wonderful way to approach God if you've never turned from the right or the left. Jesus said to that rich young ruler, what's written in the law? What's written there? And Jesus said, do this and you will live. Do you know what Jesus didn't say? Well, just give it your best shot. Just try as hard as you can. After all, it's the effort that counts. And he didn't say that. Folks, you break that law. Everything about Sinai just screams. No failure permitted. Do the law. Do the law. And God will accept you on that basis. But I'll tell you, if you show up on Judgment Day without a Savior and you haven't kept that law, woe is you. It's like being thrown into the midst of Mount Sinai. Hail Sovereign Love. We sang the stanza, Indignant justice stood in view. To Sinai's fiery mount I flew. But justice cried with frowning face, this mountain is no hiding place. Don't. Anytime somebody says, I'm a good person. I haven't, I haven't done anything. You know what they're doing? They're seeking shelter at this mountain. You don't want to go there. 
You recount Pilgrim's Progress. Some here maybe have read it. Mr. Worldly Wise Man. See, Christians headed towards the straight gate. That's where evangelists told them to go. And he comes out there and here's Mr. Worldly Wise Man. Oh, and there's Mr. Legality over somewhere. His son, what is it, civility. He said he got close to that mountain. He says there came flashes of fire out of the hill that made Christian afraid that he should be burned. He sweat, he quaked, he thought it was going to fall upon his head. What do you think? When God determines to show you what it's like to approach Him by your own goodness without a Savior, you know what He does? He constructs Mount Sinai and He says, Mankind, look at it. Look at it. You want to come to me on your works? You want to come to me by being good? Well, you have, you know, basically at heart, you're a pretty good person. Is it seriously? You've never turned from the right or the left? You, listen to Jesus' words. What does the law say? Well, the law says this. Do it and you will live. Do it. And if you don't do it, it says, Cursed is everyone who does not do everything that is written in the book of the law to do it. Everything, folks. Always. This is what this mountain, it's, it's just absolutely fearful. I'll tell you, Jesus came to God this way because he was spotless. He who is without sin is what he's called in Scripture. He had no sin. He had no blemish. The Father could look at him and say, wow, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And everything about him was perfect. Unless you measure up to that, you are in Fearful trouble. Fearful beyond anything imaginable. Do you recognize whenever we ask somebody if they're a good person, and they say yes, you recognize what they're saying? They're, they're... Listen, listen. Micah says about his mountain, he said, the lame, Micah 4, 7, the lame, I will make the remnant. Those who were cast off. Oh, you see the kind of people from the nations that flow into this mountain. They were the lame. They were the cast off. They become, God makes them the remnant, a strong nation. The Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from this time forth and forevermore. God takes the broken, the lame, the cast off. But Sinai, ah, oh, the other mountain. It's just a picture of smoke and fire. It's meant, you know what it's meant to do? It's meant to just to say to men and women, boys and girls, look, your efforts at obeying the law, you need to put an end to that. It's meant, folks, it's meant to devastate us. So it's meant to, it's meant to send us running in another direction. It's meant to send us running to this Mount Zion that the author of Hebrews talks about. Ma Micah's mountain, Daniel's mountain, the one that just shatters all the human kingdoms and sets up this mountain that just engulfs the whole world. Folks, the truth is, when the author of Hebrews says, our God is a consuming fire. People just walk around casual. So what? Oh well. Judgment day. Ah, I, I've got it. I'm not concerned. Most people don't fear that God is a consuming fire. Most people just simply do not consider how utterly, absolutely serious God is about His law being kept. I tell you, to even break God's law one time is such an insult against His majesty, against His person, He will utterly and absolutely destroy you 
for one violation. It is a crime of the most heinous proportion because of the worth of the person against whom you sin. And men so lightly and slightly imagine God graves on a curve. They just think so. I'll tell you this, that mountain of Sinai is no hiding place. It spits fire and darkness. It's a hell. Most people never even considered that. They just think, oh, God's merciful. As though what? I mean, the very fact that he didn't spare his son to provide you a law keeper in your place, that speaks massively of mercy. But you see, people just say, well, God's merciful. And so they just think, somehow what? God's not really going to care if I broke his law? You better go stand at the cross before you start thinking such things. You better go hear the Son of God himself groan on that tree before you start thinking that God just casually sweeps sin under the rug. I'll tell you, if anything speaks about the horrors of the holiness of God, it is the Son of God crying out that He'd been forsaken on that cross. The Son went out. This whole picture of Sinai is meant to fill us with despair and with terror and hopelessness at ever approaching God based on our not being that bad. Uh, I'll tell you this, sinner, sinner, you in this room that are lawbreakers, don't go that way. Don't go that way to God. Do not come to God. Don't ever come to that mountain. That mountain is nothing other than a glimpse of hell. It's a manifest expression of the awful holiness of God toward lawbreakers. And it is fearful. It just screams out with the iron rigidness of the law. You break it, you die. Forever you will die, you will be damned. You break God's law and He will deal with you as the ultimate enemy. Unless one stands in the way and takes the wrath of God in your behalf. Folks, Micah's mountain. You know what the author of Hebrews says? Christian, you haven't gone to that mountain. <laughs> We had every one of us jump right out of our seats right now and just shout that there is another mountain. Christian, we haven't gone to that mountain. We've gone to Micah's mountain. We've gone to Daniel's mountain. We've gone to the Hebrew mountain, the Mount Zion, the, the heavenly Jerusalem. Now listen, yes, there was a physical Mount Zion. It used to be called Mount Moriah. It's where Isaac was offered. It was where the temple was built. David conquered that and took it from the Jebusites long ago. We know, but look, that's not the mountain being talked about here. Micah's mountain is higher than every physical mountain. Daniel's mountain, it engulfs and it fills the whole world and it trumps every other kingdom upon the face of the earth from the gold right down to the iron and clay and all the kingdoms. And this rock just smashes it to pieces and there's this mountain. This is, this is it. This is the one. This is the higher, and it rises higher than any other. It fills the whole world. It's a heavenly mountain. It's a heavenly Jerusalem. It specifically says that this is where angels gather together. You can't drive here. You can't climb this mountain. This, this is altogether not of this world. It's a, it, this is the mountain upon which this shining celestial city of the living God is to be found. But you can only come here at first by faith. You see, the author of Hebrews says to the Christians that he's writing to, you've come to this mountain. But you don't come to it physically. You come by faith at first. 
That's it. You've come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, innumerable angels, festal gathering to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. We looked at that new covenant when we took the Lord's Supper, to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Listen, folks, our life is short. We each are going to choose one mountain or the other. You know how you come to Mount Sinai? You better come having kept the law. If you're not qualified for that mountain, look, don't come to Mount Zion boasting in the way of Mount Sinai. You see what I'm saying? It's the broken, it's the lame who are received and welcome at this Mount Zion. You see, there's blood there. There's Christ and the sprinkled blood. What is that sprinkled blood? Remember, it's the blood of a new covenant. This is, this is what's at this mountain. And as we saw when we read before the Lord's Supper, what does it say? He says that He's going to forgive our sins. He's going to put them behind. You see, the thing about coming to Mount Zion is you come empty. You come broken. You come lame. You come sick. That's the only way that you come to this mountain. You can only come empty. If you're going to claim to be a good person, oh, I hope you're really good. You better be really good. You better have kept the law with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength every moment of your life. One defect, you're a dead man or a dead woman. Listen, we think so small of sin. Why? Because we're so used to doing it. Because we're sinners. Because we've never set our eyes on this mountain. We've never set our eyes on the holy God. I'll tell you, you remember Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 6. He immediately recognized, as righteous as Isaiah may have been, he was a man of unclean lips and he dwelt among a people of unclean lips and he knew it, he felt it. You remember what happened to Peter? When he, he beheld the Lord, he suddenly, the holiness of Christ, broke in upon him. He said, depart from me, I am a sinful man. I'll tell you, you come close to this God and it is, it is devastating to any sense of morality, ethics, uprightness. It just exposes our defects. If you want to talk about how good you are, there's a mountain that's going to fall on your head. You can't come to Zion's mountain with any boast. There's only one boast. You see what's at this mountain? The sprinkled blood. Oh, that's your boast at this mountain. Your mountain has blood sprinkled, the Christian mountain. That's, that's our boast. Lord, what He did in that. But, but you know what? You know, who, you know what kind of people are at this mountain? It's, it's very specifically, it says that there are the spirits of the righteous made perfect. And, and it says that God is judge of all. You know, you know the beauty about Mount Zion? is God has so perfectly worked it out that we really are righteous at this mountain, but not on our own merits, on the merits of Christ. But we are so much made perfect that God, it doesn't say God who's merciful, it says God the judge. Isn't that amazing that God would be a judge at the mountain of mercy? But see, He makes us so perfect through this spent blood of Christ that we actually can stand up to the strictest judgment and examination. And that's what will happen on Judgment Day. Not by our own merits. Not by our own law keeping. This is a place where you come 
and you bask in the glory of your sins are forgiven and they indeed are forgiven and you indeed are counted righteous. Why? Christ's righteousness imputed by the obedience of one. Many are made righteous. My sin is laid on him. He who knew no sin became sin. I am now the righteousness of God. And I actually can stand before God on this mountain and I am going to be declared perfect. He can, I can come to God as judge and he can examine me thoroughly, not a blemish. But all the credit is to Christ, not to me, folks. That's, that's what you find here. It's our boast is in the new covenant. It's in Christ's sprinkled blood. You know, there's a voice at Sinai and there's a voice at Zion. The voice at Zion is the blood of Christ. It speaks better things. There's a voice at Sinai. Cursed is everyone who doesn't do everything written in the book of the law to do them. The voice at Zion, what does it say? Well, undoubtedly, it says the Son of God has died. It's, I mean, what does the blood say? What does it speak? Doesn't it speak it is finished? It speaks good things. It speaks, this is the way to God for bad people. <laughs> That's what it speaks. It speaks, the door is open. Come. You stay out there. You're in the land of Sinai. Beware. You got to come through this door. And what does Micah say? Micah says, many nations shall come and they're going to ask God to teach his ways to them so that they may walk in his paths and they'll beat their swords into plows and spears into pruning hooks. You know what happens? You come and God takes the war out of us. Takes the fight out of us. And these people shout in Micah 4, 5, we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. Listen, the question is not whether you've come to church or you come to the knowledge of, of some doctrine or you come to baptism or you've had a certain experience. You've... Folks, the question is this, have you come to the highest of all mountains, to this God who makes the spirits of the righteous perfect and to the blood of the living Christ? That's the question. Have you come to the blood of sprinkling with no merit of your own? Have you come guilty? Have you come lost? Have you come helpless? Have you come to that blood which alone is your only hope? Everlasting hope. Have you come to this mountain upon which the trembling sinner, the halting sinner, the defiled sinner can come? with all your sores and all your disease and all your brokenness, with all the aching heart, and hear the voice of this blood. This is God's holy hill. He will walk. Whoever's here, he will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. That's our shout from this mountain. It's forever and forever. This mountain, forever, forever. So, in the later days, and brethren, if we got eyes to see, the nations are flowing in to this mountain. You just open your eyes, and you look over the last 2,000 years, and you see the Gentiles. You see them flowing. They're flowing. And you know what? A number of people in this room were caught in the flow. The flow to this mountain. This mountain's filling up. And it'll fill up. And it's this the lame that are being made, this remnant, being made into a mighty nation. And that'll be us, folks. And our head, the government will be <laughs> right now he is subduing them one after another. All the governments, all the peoples, every enemy is being made a footstool for his feet. Folks, he sits triumphant. Just awaiting till every last enemy is subdued and he will come and it will be glorious. Father, I pray that you would use something in what I've said today. I ask it in Christ's name. Amen.